This is Paula Harris, and we have the honor today of covering one of the most important stories in all of UFOlogy, a story that very few people could really work with because they didn't bother to go to Hartford, Connecticut to meet him. But this is the story of Michael Wolf, as people know him, his real name being Mike, Michael Wolf Cruvant. And when I went to Hartford, I saw it on his mailbox. Uh, and the book was called Catchers of Heaven. So I'm going to have a conversation long distance. This is really exciting with Maurizio Baiata from Rome, who was my editor at the time and translated the book into Italian. It is now available in bookstores in Italy in Italian. And with Stephen and Kate Geller, who were very close to Michael, and with Stephen being a screenwriter and writing the screenplay for an entire motion picture. With Kay. With, 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 Kay. Kay. with Kay. Stephen and Kay together, because they knew him and visited him. Uh, this motion picture, which who knows in the future if they will get made, um, it would be the most amazing disclosure document ever. So welcome everybody. Hi there. Hey. Hey. Well, it's our pleasure to be here. <laughs> okay, and I will, I can start by uh, Maurizio. I'm going to start with the Gellers because sure. they, they met him, I think, before we even got to him. So how did you hear about Michael Wolf and, and how did you um, I believe there was a newsletter that we received that Richard Boylan wrote, published, and there was a blurb about Catchers of Heaven. And then you contacted Richard Boylan, being fascinated by it, and said, how do I get the book? And then um, he called, he actually called Michael after we got the book and Steve had been in contact with Richard Boylan to give Michael our phone number. And Michael called us. And so we spoke about, we spoke about his book and we, we talked all, all around and within the book so that we could get to some understanding of each other and where we were coming from. Both Kay and I had been for several years researching the, the uh, abduction a phenomena, and in fact, we wrote a play called Opportunities in Zero Gravity, which we had done in Boston and read in New York, uh, that uh, that dealt with seven people who had this extraordinary experience in very different ways. And the play was kind of wonderfully all over the place. And we, at any rate, it was something that we were very much fascinated with. And John Mack, who was at the head of Harvard University psychi psychiatry department, and was also the principal. Um, uh, an analyst, and I think the most serious analyst uh, of the experience phenomena, uh, we were also in contact with. At any rate, we so any anything that dealt with this, we were we, we, we were, were fascinated by and involved in, and and um, and I had also at the time had moved back to the United States from Italy, where I'd li been living for sixteen years, and um, had done a screenplay on Uri Geller and, and worked with Uri and, and a lot of the people from Lab 9, which was Andre Puharic's group that studied Geller and, and others with not only paranormal phenomena, but also with, youth, with ufology. So it was kind of part of a gathering mythos that, that I was undergoing. And then when I met Kay, we both were involved, Together. both involved in and fascinated by. And so what, I mean, I believe, this phenomena and uh, everything that Ketris is about, I think just the most important element of the latter half of the 20th century. So we were very interested in it and then uh, met Michael first over the phone and said, wow, this is someone that's <laughs> got direct contact, has been involved in what is normally kept away from the public. Let me interrupt you for a minute. I'm gonna show the picture of the book. You have it too. Yep. Uh, you have it too. Let's see yours. Okay. <laughs> I have it too. Should I grab mine? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, all right. <laughs> no, oh, oh, oh. Get the Italian. Uh, I, have to, I have to be proud of like, This is the book now is $400, uh, $400 online. And and here is his dedication to me. Oh wow! 
beautiful. It says, for my very special love, Paula, I am with you always, forever and a day. My love to you, Michael, 1998. Wow. Yeah. wow. So what year were you guys, did you? Um, I think we met him in 97. 97 and? Yes. 98 too? And 98. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. Because it took a while to, it, 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 what happened was we, we, we said the way that the way that we work is to go through the material first, do a, a, a an outline, meet with Michael, and say, okay, this is how we see the movie. We're not going to start writing it until you agree and you think this is the way to go because this is your story. So we were on, he called us every night and we were on the phone with him <laughs> practically every night for two and a half, three hours, just talking about everything, and uh, and we discovered after five minutes or five days that our phone began to be tapped and our phone from that entire time was tapped Maurizio had asked beforehand and as you had Paula well did you tape all these conversations and we said no for a very simple reason it was already being taped thank you <laughs> I didn't want to I didn't want to tape the tape I felt I'm I'm totally open in in all of this with everybody that I'm with anything that I have to say will be written down because that's what that's what we do. I'm not going to tape it uh, because it's it, it 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 for me as a writer it's an interference with a certain spontaneity. As soon as that goes on, forget it. No. Uh, and as a novelist and as a dramatist, I want the spontaneity even more than the content. Believe it or not, because that's going to ultimately the words you choose and how you say it and your body language, etc., is going to tell you everything. Yeah. So in any rate, we did the outline and we went to Hartford. And we have a juice machine. Oh yeah, we Michael, Michael was in very bad health. He was in declining health, which he writes about in Catchers. And we've been talking about uh, diets and vegetarian diets. And, Among it, other things, and we had um, started doing vegetable juices and fruit juices. So we decided that we would bring him a juice machine and a, a couple bags of vegetables and fruits to help him in his to start out so that was our house gift to him when we arrived in Hartford mm -hmm. and um, it was surprising because he was a man of such incredible prominence such importance in the scientific community and he was living in very very modest circumstances in a very modest apartment building in a not terrific area and I thought that makes a lot of sense because if you have someone that important, you would never look in that apartment building for him. But there were a lot of, I mean, there were so many, just being in his presence created even more <clears throat> uh, confounding issues. Uh, <clears throat> there was always a mysterious figure whom we'll discuss, of course, that was referred to as Roberta. And Roberta was kind of <coughs> always present, but not present. and. And Michael was, you know. She was the <laughs> offstage character. Yeah. So that we continually wondered about her and wondered about who she was and what this was all about. And Michael originally said this is his nurse. And, um, and um, on the, anyway, we won't get into that for the we'll moment. But what was the, <laughs> the first I'd like to ask, yeah, I, that's how you met him. And we'll discuss your relationship with him. But Maurizio, how yep. did you, why did you even? What were you involved with, Michael? How did you get involved with Michael? Um, I first heard about Michael Wolf uh, because I had a subscription for a major British magazine called UFO Magazine, run by um, Graham Burzel, who left us too bad, um, say the least 10, 15 years ago. And he was a great researcher. Um, Michael was presented in an article which dealt with his figure and the importance of what he was telling to everybody because of the, the main contents of the book. But I believe also that um, a um, short uh, interview to our friend, our common friend, the, the pilot, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jim um, Courant. Jim Courant was in within boxed in the article, and I decided immediately that that was a big 
big, big shot. I mean, somebody that really, who really was um, into uh, the field. In fact, I believe I called Graham Berzola. I spoke to him. I said, hey, Graham, you're, you're a sort of a concerted, conservative uh, publisher, usually. Very courageous, actually, to, uh, from your part, to go out such an outrageous story without confirmation, without verification. And he said, yes, but it's too exciting. And our readers, British readers, they already said that it's a major story. So I believe that either that was by then that I called you, Paola, or I start talking to Adriano and my, my uh, uh, collaborators, associate partners in the, in the magazine, and uh, we tried to, uh, to find out something else about him, but everything was secluded or it didn't appear any, any, anywhere else but that article. So we decided that that was the moment to, uh, to tell you, Paula. Yeah, and then uh, you sent me with Adriana. I'd like to share my screen for a minute uh, in order to have you um, see some, uh, some, if I could do that, uh, photos of, uh, I don't, okay, Michael Wolf. Can you see this, everybody? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that is the uh, first time that we went. I went with Adriano. There we are all in the bed with Michael. He's smiling. He has his scrubs on. Um, this is how Michael was when he would be talking to you guys. Do you see that? Sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, that, he spent three quarters of his life doing that. Notice that he, he has strange eyes. He didn't have irises that we could see. And of course, the one time that I made him do <laughs> an, uh, an interview, a movie, I made him put on a, uh, a docker shirt. So he, uh, and he looked very good. He didn't wear the doctor scrubs. I said, you got to get dressed. Uh, <laughs> and this is what you need to see. I, I photographed a lot of these things, uh, which is the New York Academy of Sciences and his PhDs and, and his degrees. You see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. So we're going to plug in a few more photos and, uh, and talk about him in general. Um, Maurice, do you have the, do you have the one with uh, Fellini? Yeah, yeah. From the eight, eight, eight and a half. All right. Eight and a half. I have that from one. From the spa sequence. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, um, I'm going to try to find it while you talk. But um, Maurizio translated the book later on into. Yeah. Okay. This uh, is the the okay. the edition, the American there edition. You go. Right. I do American have edition. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a typical dedication, Michael's dedication oh, is <laughs> oh, wow. which is, you you need to be you need to be a lawyer and a scientist and a physicist all together in order to understand his writing. But actually, what was important was what it, it was written in it. My dear friend, my beloved friends, please accept this tardy gift. I forgot last time. You're becoming my very best friend. I stay with this right now because otherwise I become too, you know, too moved about this. And this is the Italian edition. This is the Italian oh, wow. edition, right, yeah. right. Yeah. The last Italian edition yeah. called The Guardians of, the, of, of Heaven. Yeah. Because first of all, the Catchers pronounce of Heaven. It in Italian, Maurizio. You pronounce it in Italian. Uh, I Guardiani del Cielo, okay. a trilogy. Okay. You know why? Because I spoke at length and I de debated partially with Michael regarding the title, The Catchers of Heaven is not, it's, you cannot translate it in any language. Uh, from the title to the, the, the entire 400 pages approximately of this book, the complication of the task was impossible to afford. I mean, I know that many others tried in Germany, in England, no, not in England, and in France, for sure. And even in Japan, somebody tried to um, translate the, that book with no avail. It was really impossible. So yes. for us was a question of, you know, <laughs> uh, take it or leave it. We had to do it for sure. Sure, so sure. That's what it, 
that's what we done. Right. I, um, we translated twice, by the way. First time oh. was called oh. Afferrando il Cielo, another, another edition, 1999. And the new one came out two years ago, two thousand. I mean, wow. two years ago, 2017. Oh. Revised and corrected and, and, uh, and, and now I do understand what is written in his book, you know. Uh, 15, year, 15 years ago, I didn't, even though my English was pretty close to the one I have right now. Um, the, you, you, you both guys, you know that it's very, very difficult to understand. And to well, there, are, there are so many different voices of Michael in the book. And that's, yeah. one of the, that's one of the confounding uh, and, and, and fascinating aspects of of the of the work itself because there is there is the there's the, the psychological elements that are very acute and very ambiguous and 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 hidden and there are the 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 hard science which is the most i i mean i find the most interesting uh then there is the love story which i find the least interesting uh but it's there and and there is with that is an is a total emotion he gives himself over in each instance to um, to a different voice and a and a and a different, I think a different personality. I'm not I'm not I'm not speaking uh, as if I were because I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm speaking as a writer uh, in love with human voice and in love with language and saying, okay, where do you come from? What is this sentence coming from? What what emo what emotional or conscious state is producing this thought? And that's one of the things that made Michael for us in, in, in attempting to dramatize this is to somehow find a way of, of creating a character whose background, which is enormous, huge, um, to find a certain consistent through line so that we, can, we ourselves can not only watch, but in, certain, in a certain human way, identify with the phenomena in which he is a part of which he is a part and at the same time there is the bigger issue which we both continue to discuss and continue and, and which we are not certain of which is did the michael wolf we meet we met in hartford was the michael wolf we met in hartford the I michael mean, wolf or saying, was it the clone there are so many interesting things about it. First of all, like all the layers of love story, I think are pointing to soul origin. Right. And I think he was, before we get into the clone issue, I think that he was grappling with how to convey his soul origin. There are so many times in the book when he says he's not from here and he's, he's has to be here and he's like, railing he's, he's like saying to god why do i have to be here and the loves that he has all have a similar kind of soul origin and physicality they are they tend to be whether it's his half brother it's his wife it's his son or it is the replacement son after his wife and son are killed. Okay, we need to stop here because the person that didn't read the book don't know what you're talking about unless we talk about <laughs> okay. that part. So let me share the screen for a minute again. I'm gonna share the screen because I found what we need. Uh, first of all, this is Michael again. You see him? You see Michael in the yep. screen? Okay, you see Michael, do you see behind Michael all of his degrees? This is right, what, yes. He did not want people to see. He was freaked out totally. Um, but there, there's a, this is Michael at the computer uh, so that people can see this was his wife. See Sarah's picture mm -hmm. right there. This was the first computer lab he did evidently for the Department of Defense or whatever. This was a, a HAL type computer. There's, there's also a small, Paula, there's also a very small, tiny picture of Daniel. Daniel's, I mean, yes. yeah. Daniel's here too. Yes, yes, and yes. yes. Mm, I remember uh, that. A his son, his son. The purposes. Uh, yes, right. and this is what you guys wanted. This mm. is the, That's the eight and a half. Oh, yeah. These are the photos of Maurizio. You know this because he was in eight and a half. This yeah. is Marcello Mastroianni. 
Yeah, one of the best Italian actors. Okay, there's ever. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, what's his Bellini. name? Bellini. This woman, I'm not sure she's in the movie. She's down here too. It's and not. It's not. Any, uh, we found out it's not Anita Ekberg. No, uh, no, 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 no. Might no, be another not. one. Another one, but I don't. I don't get it. But this is Michael here. This is Michael. You see him right here. Right over her head, and this is him in the sheet. Right in the spa scene. Yeah, and I but, can't. You know, you are right. I think that the that he's right over uh, Eckberg. Uh, that yeah. is, I think that yes, I think that is Eckberg. You think that's Eckberg? Yes. Yeah, not the you one over so? here. Not the one. Not the one above Mastroianni. The one below no, him. Below. And, yeah, okay, this. Oh, below. the one. Yeah, the one in there might be yeah. Eckberg. It is. Eckberg. I recognize her eyes. I knew her. I recognize her eyes. I mean, that was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was something when we met him and we found out that he had been an eight and a half. And it's like, what are the odds of this incredible man being in perhaps the Greatest finest movie, movie that will ever be made? Who? Yeah. And, and, yeah. Well, what is that? And he was okay. talking about, uh, I don't know if this is jumping ahead, but he, we did talk about the rocket ship being built in eight and a half was going to be a craft. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's then right. That's when right. Woody Allen did Stardust Memories, which is based upon eight and a half, he actually has the craft and the aliens instead of the rocket ship. Oh, that's it's, great. It's interesting. Yes. You're right, absolutely right. This, this is the piece, and I have it somewhere here, because he gave it to me. He gave me three pieces to analyze, brought one to Italy. I was supposed to send one to Bill Hamilton who said it was a $5 piece of silicone you could buy over the, the, and it was not, because I'll let Maurizio go into detail about what it was. This is the picture that you asked about, okay? The one that, with the coming out of the room? Uh, this is with the two beings coming out of the room. That's Pierre Aubin. This picture was taken uh, by Colta. He picked up the camera, and this behind him, I got a copy of this, after Michael died, that came from Colorado Springs, they said the special gift for you, but it had a blue matting, not this matting. So I don't know who in the world sent it to me, but this being the tall one is reflected. I've got in this, and I have the uh, enlargement of this picture because it's got glass. So this being the tall one came out of Michael's bedroom, which was here, the tall one. And then the short one, the baby looking one from the book is Colta. So this was sent to me by Oban. Okay. And uh, I have even, I have the, uh, you know, the close up. But we're, uh, people are getting mixed up because we're giving them all these details. But in essence, since you did the screenplay and we could go really fast through this, Michael's experience started when he was a child. Do you want to just go into it, uh, Stephen? Real? No, go right ahead. You're 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 okay. on the roll. Yeah, it was he was a child, and what had happened was that he and his brother Ron had an abduction experience. If you want to call a contact, I don't like the word abduction. A contact experience, and it was in New Jersey, and it changed Michael, but mostly it changed his IQ. So that when he went to high school. In those days, and I studied that whole Starfleet Academy with right. Jack Sarfati. Do you remember we interviewed Jack Sarfati at the Ritz? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, could you uh, uh, w w could just briefly, I mean, Sarfati was uh, constantly after me from the script. What was the relationship between uh, Sarfati? Okay. And Jack, Jack Sarfati in those days was interested, so he followed Richard Boylan and all of that. Right. He, he is a scientist that is working with the government to try to back engineer alien technology. But he's a quantum that, physicist, basically. He's quantum okay. physicist. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In San Francisco, when he was fifteen, he got a robotic call from a spaceship. Mm -hmm. Sarfati did. Sarfati did when he was a child. His mother okay. had him on the phone. This said, "I am from the spaceship." It was a robotic voice. It He said the voice said you will meet others like you in the future. So Sarfati then went with a whole cadre of physicists he'd been working with now. I'm not gonna name them all, but um, you know, the, one of them that Michael used to talk about was Bernard Haish, you know, the, the drive. They were looking at the, uh, the drive of the, uh, uh, you know, Bernie Haish and of the, 
and, and the group in San Francisco that is trying to back engineer. That includes today Hal Putoff and those guys. But uh, Sarfati got this call from an alien spaceship. In other words, Sarfati also at 15 became a physicist. He belonged to what's called Starfleet Academy, which was in San Francisco, and it was run by Walter Breen. And if you know Walter Breen, he is the head of Mensa. He created Mensa. Okay. So mentally go to, they're getting all the people that have been downloaded that are high IQ. So right, of, right. Course, of course, uh, if you're connecting dots, Michael, who is high IQ, all of a sudden, uh, it, it, the call goes into, and it's in the book, um, Jesse Jesus Angleton, who is right. James, uh, Jesus uh, James, 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 and Jesse is the son. Because the right. Jesse wrote to Michael saying, I saw you in my father's diaries. Well, well, this is very important. And I'll, I'll get to that point later on. You remind me, talk about my experience in Rome. Okay, so the thing is, so, so right away, he's pulled, you know, he's pulled over to Princeton to be examined. His IQ is shut up. And uh, he said he met Einstein. And he said Einstein was on a chair. Uh, in uh, on, a, on a, one of those houses, and he, he said, I hear you have little gray friends. I have two. He, this is what he used to tell me on the phone. I have little gray friends. He said friends. to me differently. He said to me, you have little green friends. A green and, yes. and, yeah, green friends. And Michael corrected the scientists, saying, no, no, oh. they're not green at all. They're grays. And then uh, Michael said that um, Einstein said when you, you, you were on the ship, he said, yes, I was on the ship. And Einstein said, what did it look like? And Michael said, there were no seams, there were no walls. No, he said he was talking about doors and he said, how did you get from one room to the next? And he said, there were no, there were no doors. There, no, said, there were no angles, there were no edges. You there didn't were no seams. There, 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 and it was at that point that Einstein knew. He said, Einstein said, well, then that's true. That's, that's true. The only someone who'd been on the ship would know would that know detail that. about the doors. And that the ship um, was called Touch Me With Your Wishes, which is just extraordinary that the ships that he calls in the book, the living conveyances are actual beings that have a neurological interface with the passenger. And that's something that Michael worked on as a neuroscientist. Perfect, you know, this, this is connecting dots like beauty. I don't even remember three quarters of this, but uh, I'm glad you're rereading the book because it isn't easy to oh, I remember a lot of that was from discussion too. Yeah. Because I was trying to find that in the book, but that I'm, you know, I haven't reviewed the entire book. Um, I, in the past few days, I've been going through it, but I couldn't find that part. But I remember him being very emphatic about that. And I also remember saying, well, that's really interesting because Einstein said that he got E equals MC squared in a dream. And that's what he told the public. And then he spent so much time trying to figure out what it meant. Well, it makes sense if he had contact as a young person the way Michael did, that he was given this information and then the task as an adult to decipher it or to really back engineer what that formula meant, so to speak. Okay, so from uh, Princeton, he was noticed because he started working with remote viewing that piece, once I got into his apartment, he told me it was given to him by um, Albert, I think it's Albert Stubberline and his wife, uh, I think he said her name was Rhea or Reba, Reba. And so that, those pieces, they were given to him, were given to him to put in water because they thought they would cure him of his cancer. Mm -hmm. So he was supposed to drink the water from those pieces and whatever, but he was a great remote viewer. So that's how he got to Italy because in those days, Maurizio, maybe you could fill in, there was the Archilli Loro case and the Red Brigade. And there was a series of American remote viewers that worked on that. And then the book starts, and then we'll get to Stephen, when his son said, Dad, we'll never see you. Uh, you know, can we go back home? So Michael told me that the accident that he had was in Bern, Switzerland, that he was taking his pregnant wife and son back home. They had rented a U-Haul, he said. 
and they had everything in there and there was the explosion and that's where the film starts. But Mauricio, can you go back to the Achille Loro case? Because he told me mm. he thought that's why the car bomb went off, the explosion went off. I believe he was a loose cannon and, they, and our own people wanted to get rid of him. But you tell me what, the, tell everybody what the Achille Loro case was, you remember? Well, well, yeah, the Achille Loro case was a case of um, two Americans were, um, I'm not saying hijacked, were, sequ are you say sequestered? Yeah, they were aboard the ship. Kidnapped. Yeah, kidnapped, yeah. Kidnapped, kidnapped, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the name of the fellow, they, they were both Jewish, I believe. Yeah, yeah. it was Klinghoffer. Klinghoffer, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, my mind is a little confused about this. It, 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 it was a ship that, it was a no, ship. No, 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 I know the entire story, but the only problem with me is that I was in the United States. I was working with Italian Progresso, the Italian newspaper. Right, right, right. So everything I, I didn't, I didn't have any chance to leave the, the right. experience being in Italy. So I received all the news from Italy to our newspaper right. and it was extremely confused. The only thing that I can say is that the Italian government fought a bad war in between a terrorist attack that actually got successful because you know they wanted to obtain something and the obscure forces that were also involved in the uh, um, Red Brigade. Well, not really. The Red Brigades what, weren't too involved in. Okay, they were accused that they did the kidnap, but we never got for real. Okay. Can, I, can I add? Can I add one thing to this that yeah. that of that period? Because I lived through that. I mean, I was living yeah. in the So maybe you, you you know and, better than me. And the the I can give you one example that I thought was rather extraordinary. Um, at that t time, there was um, I was very very involved. That's actually when I was working with um, I, I was studying a lot of psychic phenomena and and being very active in it and i um met malcolm mcdowell was in was in italy shooting that horrible caligula movie uh and uh, and we were friends and he was going to do a movie of mine and uh so we met a, a great deal of the time and i was doing um radiestesia uh, which is holding, you know, holding an object, getting a sense of where it's there, of what's there, and so on. And he, he said to me, um, "I have a, a piece of jewelry. Can you tell me about this?" Now, this is, I'm, I'm not. Uh, this is not apocryphal. I'm talking about the period. Mm -hmm. And so I t took this p piece of jewelry and I said, "Yes, this was given to a woman who was married, who is, um, who is married to another. I mean, this is given to a woman by a man who is married to another woman." Um, and I describe her physically, and I describe the man, and the next day, Malcolm comes back and says, I've got something for you, could you, something else to do? I, I, I'm not, I said, well, am I right or not? He said, I'm not gonna tell you. Mm -hmm. He said, I've got uh, something else I want you to, to see what you can get, get from, and, uh, and I said, okay. And he, he brings me a coat, and uh, he says, all right, uh, take a look at this coat and tell me about it. And he just hands me a part, part of it. And I look at it and I said, holy shit, pardon me. This is, um, this is dreadful. Someone was assassinated in this. And he opens the coat and there's a big hole on the lower side. And he says, okay, I'm gonna call a friend of mine. And so he calls a man, a man, a man comes in with his wife and sits down and it actually wasn't his wife, it was the person he had given the, 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 uh, the, the jewelry too. <laughs> and he said, all right, um, tell me about this. So I tell me about this coat. So I, t I take the coat and I said, I need a map. And I take, take a map and the coat and I start dousing it. And I said, all right, this was the person who had this coat is alive still. He was, he was um, kept a prisoner for th 31 days. And then he was released. He was shot, he was released. Uh, where was he kept a prisoner? And I douse it again, I take a map and I just go, it goes right to the Via Nomentana. 
I mean, boom, it was like, it was so fast. And he said, who's involved in this? And so I said, well, let me have it. I make an alphabet and I start doing an alphabet thing. C-U-R-C-I-O. And the person says, Curcio, who's behind this. I said, yeah, but he's not the one who did this. He's the one who's behind it. The person who did this is Yugoslav, who did the shooting. All right. So the person who was there with the friend, in front, he says, okay, um, I'm Johnny Bulgari and I had been shot and I was kidnapped. And I was only kidnapped for 29 days. And I said, no, you're not. You were kidnapped for 31 days. And he said, how can you say that? I know it. I said, because I said, if, if you were kept in the Nomentana and you were, and, 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 he, and it was near, an airport. He said, I said it. I told the Marishali it was near an airport. And they said, no, it couldn't have been near any airport, wherever you were kept. There was, he said, I know I fly planes. I knew the sound of planes. And I knew it was near the Rome airport, not Fiumicino, the, the, the local one. And it's just not far from the, Yeah. And, you know, exactly. Ciampino. And it went, and the flight was right over this area. Okay. So, um, he said, okay, 31 days because my insurance company covers that long. Mm -hmm. So that, I asked the kidnappers, could I stay an extra two days? Okay. The next day, Malcolm said, let's go out and see. Um, let's go to Nomentana and see if we can find this place where he's kept. So we drive out and this is absolutely, we finally get to the area. It's completely anonymous. Just these, uh, you know, ugly apartment buildings that are around nowhere, and then a field, and it just goes down to the Anience, just one part of the, one of the rivers that's totally mm -hmm. polluted that runs through Rome. And we go through this fence, and I'm just dousing my way to the, and we go, it goes down the hill. Now you can't see where the river is. You're between the river and these old apartment buildings um, that, and that, are, that are on the other side of, this, of the Nomentana. And we get down, and there's this little farmhouse, and this little house, and I said, shit, I don't want to, uh, can we leave now? I mean, this, I know no one's going to be around because it's already over with. And is he going to split, you know, but Malcolm being, you know, the, the star of Clockwork Orange says, no, mate, we're going to go straight ahead. So we get on into this, build this little farmhouse, open a side door, and it's just filthy. And it's awful, but there's a little stairwell. And we go up the stairwell, and you can see a lot of footsteps. I mean, a lot of, a lot of tra foot traffic. There. Everything else is dust, foot traffic. And then uh, two pieces of plywood that are stuck together against a wall, but now are open on the floor, and an old mattress. So I figured, okay, that mattress was against the wall. The plywood was, was up against that, so it looked like he was in its own room. So anytime he had to go to the bathroom, he'd have to kind of move that plywood and go down the stairs or wherever he went to the john. So I, I go back, I call up Bulgari, and I said, did you, were you upstairs? He said, yeah, every time I had to go to the bathroom, we had to go up these stairs. I said, was your mattress on the ground? He said, yeah. I said, were there a piece of plywood? He said, well, they always had to move this wall, and it was the place. It was the place. And he said the reason that he could never fight the state in terms of an investigation, it was the difference between you know, the Carabinieri and the, and the local police, the whole political issue, you never knew who was, you never knew who was involved with whom. And Absolutely. the fact that there was Curcio, who's, you know, Brigate Rosse, one yeah. of the leaders of the Brigate, and I didn't know Curcio's name at that point. It was not known. It was Curcio, mm -hmm. and, and he gave this Yugoslav, and according to a friend of mine who was a reporter on the Paese, said, the Yugoslav groups, the right-wingers, are used so often by extreme left and vice versa. So you never know who's involved in any kind of action. You can't say it came from the right, it came from the left, and so on. So that's the kind of political and social climate, uh, Maurizio, that was existing at the time of the Achille Lora. Mm -hmm. that was, uh, and, you know, I mean, all over the street. And she, it was, yeah. I mean, Achille Lora was a hijacking of an actual cruise liner, and they threw yeah, cruise yeah. liner. Yeah. 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 The cruise man, and I forgot that it, he was in a wheelchair. That was right. Klinghoffer. Right. That was yeah. John Adams wrote, a, wrote a, a, an opera about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's actually an opera. You, you mentioned Malcolm. Was, was he involved with Clockwork Orange, the movie? He was sure. the lead. 
Yeah. The lead. Oh, yeah. that was Malcolm McDowell. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. He was. This is this is a whole other interview about Stephen. By the no, way, no. it's gonna get dark. It's it gets dark and light. So you guys stay right there. Don't move because. Uh, Are we getting light, dark and light? Okay, how's that? Is that, that? is that better? That's better because you're getting like black. So that was the that was the atmosphere that Michael was working in. Absolutely. And, that, and because I was living in Rome at the time. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the two car bombs when I was working on this. But um, the thing is, because I was working uh, in Rome at the time, I realized, uh, he told me he stayed, he had gone, uh, he had stayed at the Excelsior, which was true. He had gone to coffee at Donay's on Via Veneto, which you know where that is. Sure. Mm -hmm. And he, he was at the Sporting Hotel. And he got, his pharmacy was across the street because evidently he was getting meds even then. And then he had gone to Spoleto Film Festival. So all the American researchers that called him a liar, that it's said he had true. never left the country, it's, never bothered to do. Yeah, I mean, it's not theater. true. Yeah. His, uh, I mean, the more uh, outrageous he was in, in, in yeah. his statement, the more true it was. It was not I will, I I will just add one little thing, which is just my point of view, that he was an actor by chance, in, in other words, in order to cover his real activity, you know, right. because he, he was an handsome man. He was very probably fluent in any language and he was also an actor for real. So, um, you know, you live a double life or maybe a triple life, or maybe in this case, a fourth life, because nobody knows really where he was coming from, when he arrived in Italy for the first time ever, when we got a ticket, though. We got a ticket. You, you, you did some research. Well, the research that we've done, we I, have it, I have it. I have it. From 1960. Right. Huh. I do. Yes, that, that's for sure. But, but there is a big mystery. I don't know if we can get into this little not, uh, not uh, so uh, non-important detail where he comes from and where he, what really, which, uh, I mean, <laughs> what is his real life? Right. Because right. we, we, we know, yeah, yeah, who is Michael Wolf? Right. Because we know right. something regarding his, um, his life uh, as far as the book contents, meaning around his, you know, uh, adolescent life when he was 12, 13, 14. That's the beginning of, of the book, I believe, approximately. Well, also, you also I think a very important point is you, you brought up, the you mentioned James Jesus Angleton, and and you, you think of the, you think of the, the charm of that particular pol political invention of America, and you cannot, you, you have to go back to MK Ultra because he exactly. was the he was the, the the you know the executor as it were of that, and uh, and from there, Michael is involved, and that's so much a part of the Vietnam part of Michael, of the orphanage and the and the you know and that but that goes back to that goes back to the whole American uh, uh, um, idea of utilizing MK Ultra to to create. A, uh, a Manchurian candidate using, you know, every kind of drug, using every kind of, of hallucinogen, using every kind of mind, uh, um, you know, a, a mind experiment. And Michael was very much a part of that as well and admits it. And he, yeah. he has a very, he has a very um, ambivalent attitude towards Eagleton yeah. that made, never made any sense well, to me. You know, and, that, and, that, towards that's that, and towards his own ethics, exactly. That's, I mean, the ethical that's, dilemma is a huge part of the novel. Of the, of the, of the book. I believe that book. this is a, a kind of a painting of a man which uh, depicts that he really was definitely aware of the importance of his mission on Earth. And by the same token, he had the responsibility of doing stuff that nobody knew. Uh, at that time, you yeah. know, yeah. We, we couldn't talk about, uh, we couldn't even imagine that we were talking about what remote viewing or being cloning, a, a spy, cloning I mean, or being a spy, a, a, a psych spy. 
now well, that's something yeah, that's, just, that's so um you know yeah. in public now quantum computing he's talking about quantum computing and, and working on quantum computing research decades and decades ago i yeah, showed no, a picture of the lab that he did the picture of the lab yeah, you, you, right, right, you right. Okay. yeah i had the picture um, of the lab yeah <clears throat> I want so to there are all the different faces that Mauricio was talking about before and Paula and, and, and us that, you know, and all of which are incredibly compelling because he's completely involved in each in each phase. Exactly. And, and then and then also what happened all the time with us also well, fighting each face when you push further. And it's not not that we were pushing the reality of this identity because we completely accepted it. Now, and as we do uh, accept it, uh, the importance being a journalist, what I want to do all the time is come is uh, uh, check on the uh, or verify the uh, the authenticity, sure, the course. possible authentic authenticity of a um, a declaration. Otherwise, you go like no, Absolutely. And you become You're a no no right. in no right. time. Okay, good. So, I wasn't able to go through any of my contacts to to get in touch to, with all my contacts in Italy talking about the UFO research UFO researchers that I was in contact with and talk freely openly about Michael Wolf why because Paolo and I and Adriano had the task of silence actually don't go around and first of all don't mention that his real name is Kruant but we know that his real name was Kruvant. All right. So I was running the magazine um, um, UFO Network in 1999. Or so let's say approximately a year and something before his death. And um, being the editor in chief, um, one morning, since I lived in the, in the, on the third floor of the same building where we did have the editorial department, um, I received a phone call and, um, and this gentleman on the other side of the phone um, told me his name and I knew him by his, um, because he, he was a pretty famous Italian journalist of uh, the uh, newspaper in Messaggero, mm -hmm. the most important newspaper of Rome, daily newspaper of Rome. And I used to, to, uh, to read these articles. Who, what, was his name? what was his name? No, 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 I can't. You can't? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's a, promise, it's a promise that I gave to the man. That actually, the man died afterwards, many years later. And I, uh, you know, I knew that he was dead because I read his obituary in the, in, in the newspaper mm -hmm. once, you know, I was stunned, but I knew that his health was not so great. Going to the phone call, um, this guy said to me, uh, Maurizio Bayata, yeah, all right, I need to talk to you. Why? I know you by, because you're an important journalist of Mr. Jail. Well, uh, I have to talk to you about something I cannot disclose right now on the phone. Please allow me to have a meeting with you, uh, let's say tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. A couple of days we met in the morning. This guy arrived, he was very elegant, blue suit, a tie, and so far so on. And we sit, one on either, uh, on the uh, fronting, uh, confronting each other on the, um, on the table, Head table, the head was he, there. I have him, and here I am, okay, just in front. But he wanted to get close, you know, so he sat closer to me. And he goes, like, Maritza, I need to talk to you about Michael Wolf Cruvant. I said, What? Why? Cruvant, how do you know his name? Because I'm a colleague of him. Say what again? Yeah, we were trained in England many, many years ago by the same people of uh, 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 the, you know, the British Secret Service. Sure. And and actually, our boss was J. Jesus. Sure, sure. All right. 
Well, there's so, proof right there. Because yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I, yeah, yeah. I mean, that journalist was a, very important. His rule in the newspaper was to cover the news pertaining Palestinians' affairs, affairs and the Jew, Jewish affair. This guy was also a diplomat working as a, uh, uh, since he was fluent in both languages, he was able to, you know, for the Italian embassy in both countries, right, he right. was one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the link, actually. Just... So, so he was important, but also this stuff was a cover up for Of course, of course. Right. That's, that's, see, that is, I mean, what Maurizio is mentioning, and that is, that's, you know, another face. And that's what is so confounding about Michael is that his involvement in all of these worlds, in all of these worlds, was total and, yeah. uh, and committed. And, you know, we can think, I, I think we can pull back all of us and say, well, if we're going to talk about certain themes in our lives at a certain time, we're, you know, we naturally, uh, we gravitate to this kind of person, we gravitate to this kind of idea, this kind of music, these kind of films. There's, there's a, um, there is a, um, a core of psychic and psychological and spiritual and emotional and physiological belief that defines us. That, you know, that's our recognition with each other as friends, as, you know, et cetera. You, you couldn't find the core in Michael because it was like there is this world and this world and this world and this world. And it's how, also how does it come together? It's also how do you incomprehensible it for someone, for us to think of someone being a subatomic physicist, a neuroscientist, yes. um, a computer PhD scientist, Actor, a, an and, and a pilot. And, and in love with Charlie. And, so and, and an eight and a half. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and I mean, so exactly. there he is, an eight and a half, like the best movie ever made. So he's in that. So And it's real. And, and there's the photograph. Real. It's not... And, and then there's, you know, I'm looking at a character and I, you know, as a writer and also as an actor, I'm looking at how a person presents themselves. And my father was a surgeon and my father went from a suit when he was out in the world, suit tie, whole thing, custom suit, to scrubs. He was never in pajamas. He wore scrubs when he was home. So I walk in, I meet Michael. He's in his scrubs. I'm saying, he's a doctor. Because a doctor is never not a doctor, even when he's home. Right. And the way he organized the, the, files the file and cabinets, papers the file and cabinets. all these documents that he, he would give us the documents. And it was like, you know, he, he was lonely. And he was like, you know, you want us to come back? He goes, well, the next time you come, I'm going to show you this document. He had these files and files of documents. And he filed everything exactly like my father did. As okay, a surgeon tell, and as a scientist. You, tell Maurizio what document you saw because Maud, uh, what's, uh, Adriano and I saw the same document. He wouldn't let us photograph it. The Carter briefing. The mm -hmm. President Carter briefing. briefing. That was amazing. I mean, there it was. And there were notes. And he had notes. Little I mean, notes. You know. And, <laughs> you know, and he's like pulling it out and it's legit. I mean, we are, yeah. we're there in 1997. We're not there now where there's Photoshop and there's digital this and digital that. We're seeing like legit documents. The photograph that you showed and the reflection in the glass. They didn't have Adobe Photoshop then. Or that's, CGI. That's for I mean, it's real. for real. These things were for real. Other thing that was very noteworthy about Michael, other than his scrubs, was his skin and his eyes. Yes, his skin. He is had the, the biggest dark brown liquid eyes that were full of compassion that I had ever seen. They did not look human. His skin. He was what in his sixties then. I don't his, his skin 50, was like a baby. 50 skin. Five, 50 yeah. it was, his skin was so smooth like a baby skin. There was no blemish or wrinkle or mark. It was just this, like a naturally beautiful, radiant skin. The other thing that was weird about visiting him, it went, the environment went from extremely cold, he'd have the air conditioning blasting, 
and then super hot. And then he had one room that he kept super hot. And he's like, excuse me, I have to go in this room for a few minutes. And he'd go in there and he'd come back. And I'm thinking, there's something physiologically unusual. Mm. Then he called us up one day and he said, it's so weird. My cholesterol is 2,700. He said, it's like a porpoise. So is his skin. So is his skin. You know, I mean, it was... It was now, a person, you know, when their cholesterol is over 200, the doctor says, you're not you've got a high cholesterol. You need to take this. Well, his triglycerides were high, too. His triglycerides were high, too. Everything, like everything, 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 everything. Not else. like... like yeah. thousands. I mean, you're, you're not talking about... about I mean, we're I just so beyond normal but range. I actually saw the medical reports when I was there. He showed them to me. So yeah, I yeah. was going back, I was revisiting this because, you know, I have the recollections of being immersed in it when we wrote the screenplay over 20 years ago. And I recall one of the things that was so compelling was when he was involved in creating the clone for the military. The actor, Joe. 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 And uh, he yeah. downloads Joe with all of his memories and morality and his humanity to the point where no joe is now being tested by the military and the military says you need to shoot this dog now michael had taught him that since he was going to be working with the military that part of the military code is if you're given a command that's immoral that you have the right to refuse the command if there is an immoral reason why this command should not be carried out and Joe says, when he's given the command to shoot the dog, I can't shoot the dog. There's, the dog didn't do anything wrong. I refuse to shoot the dog. At which point, the military official said to Michael, Joe must be exterminated with extreme prejudice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going so, to one, one thing, Kay. When I, in the talking, I have all the 70 audio tapes. The dog was in a cage. Even. Yes. It was in a cage. Uh, he, so he told me the dog was in the cage when it happened. But the dog's not posing any threat to anybody. The dog is just kill is the a dog. Prisoner. Right. Kill the kill innocent the dog. That was prisoner the point. Dog. That was the point. So Michael, with the help of his assistant, stages that they're going to kill Joe, and Joe is spirited out of there and is given a life of anonymity. It's a very Joe, big, big point, that whole biochemically analysis. and genetically had to have a very unusual physiology in order for anyone to go from cellular, you know, a zygote to an adult human being in 365 days. It does this not happen. This accelerated and then experience, as we know with all animals that are cloned, they experience some degeneration, a natural unusual physiological degeneration my question it was a question that lingered for me was was the person that we were interacting with and i just pose it as a question and this may not have anything to do with the rest of our conversation but what, for me this was an important question was the person we were interacting with who wrote this book, which is an accumulation of memories and sensations and love, and it's all time skip and gad about jumping around, and we're trying to find the narrative linear thread in all of it. Was that person with the smooth skin and the liquid eyes and this and naturally this charismatic yearning for contact? And if it and, and the, 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 the temperature two, range, the temperature, unusual temperature look, look. environment, was this Joe with all the memories of Michael trying to make sense of a life when the real Michael went through the portal, as he says the entire time, I want to go home, I want to go off world, I want to go with Colta. Were we? He sets that right in the beginning. Were, I mean, it's in the first he, chapter. He sets it right up. You know, where you now looking at it now, twenty years later, it's like shit. You I know, some I'm, giving, I'm, I'm giving you giving you the answer right from the beginning. We, uh, it, it, here's here's Michael on the screen, so you keep people can. I just put it to share screen. Did you see? Have you seen this? Uh, I I just 
shared the screen with you. Uh, yeah, 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 I see it. Mm -hmm. him here. Uh, that that part K would be an incredible film, uh, it, but I'm going to counter that a little bit. I'm going to counter it a little bit in that Michael had false teeth. And I don't think Joe would ever have false teeth because when I saw him just before he died, he was another, he, I have a photo of him about a, a month or two before he died. He, he didn't look like any of that. Uh, he, def, he had false teeth. He had his teeth out. So I, he has another face. No, no, he was a real human being. That's my He was point. a real human That's being. Well. He had, yeah. He had his and Joe was too. And Joe was a clone. What happened to Joe? Joe went to have a life with. Probably Dr. they Adam. disposed of him. You know, they, he was disposable. No, I think he. No, he saved him. No, he saved him. He saved him and blows up he's, the lab. He's, he's, well, he saved him. But we don't we don't know him. what after after. No, we don't know what happened no. afterwards. No. Yeah. No, because There's I don't know think Michael was Joe because he wouldn't have had a handler. But anyway, his skin was yellow. He didn't have any teeth anymore. He was a different kind of person. And I talked to Michelle that took him home uh, to hospice. So, uh, and, and he was a real mystery because when he died, they couldn't find a wife. They couldn't find that he was married. They couldn't find anything for his- Oh, they took, uh, Paula, they took, I mean- They removed, there was a, they removed everything. I mean, we went yeah. through that. We went through that the whole time. And, yeah. and, and uh, one of the reasons I had asked you initially about Serfati was mm -hmm. that um, I don't know how he, I don't know, I don't know what happened, how he found, how Serfati found out that we had did the script. And, and I kept getting emails from him saying, I want to see the script, I want to see the script, da 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 da. And I, find, and I sent it to him because as I say, it's totally oh, open. I said, oh, I sent it to Safadi. Oh, yeah, I said, yeah, I said, I said, here. And he never said anything afterwards. And I, I believe Safadi was, was, yes, working with the government, which is a, a euphemism for CIA, any more than say, well, you know, Putoff is a really super guy, but, you know, SRI was also, let's not kid ourselves. It was, a, you know, I mean, anything having to do with MK Ultra, anything having to do with, the paranormal is government funded and, and well, well, in the sixties and the seventies. Forget buried, it. And, buried. and buried. And, and anything uh, that has to do also with Majestic Twelve. Uh, yes. Oh, absolutely, and uh, of so, course, Majestic Twelve. So can you? And and, old, and Angleton was a part of Majestic Twelve. Can you talk very very quickly about how you organized that script and what happened, Stephen. How we organized it? Well, we went through. Yeah, you and Kay together because you both knew him. Yeah, how, how very much both, so. How did you both write that? I mean, where did you? You, have, you, start? To, you have to go through the novel each time and read for each story. We had and to, each Michael. We had to play with different Michaels because there are different Michaels in the okay, book. The script, if I remember correctly, because I didn't read it all, begins with him in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a way to address the jumping around and the emotion, the memories and the, the kind of structure that's in the novel, which is nonlinear. Yeah. So it's a way of recovering from, I mean, you can imagine in a person's life, the most traumatic moment, and that would bring up the guilt um, of everything he's done ethically would be this explosion of his, his car exploding with his wife unborn child and son in the car and the explosions meant for him not for them and yet he's the one that survives and he's racked with guilt thinking i've brought all this on by everything that right. i've done and that's addressing that kind of ethical dilemma he's facing in the entire book and, and then you can kind of address the kind of structure in the book by having that recovery period and the well what does Walk us through how you did that because I know the beginning as he wakes up in the hospital, then then where do you go? You don't go to his childhood at all. You just go straight to his work. Oh no no no! It it, it there as 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 Kay mentions that script travels, but it travels from different periods, uh, and it but it is it's based thematically based on one's the consciousness that you have did i resolve this i'm work i i i am i am starting i'm i have to accomplish a but there is a sub a that happened before and that i i blew 
or that I did not understand. And in order for me to make this relationship work, I really do have to, I find myself dreaming. I find myself going back in mind, addressing the past. And I make this decision. So we have, what we're doing is setting up a past present resolution, well, past present resolution. You can look as at the story, just of the story of Michael and Colta. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, say, yeah. okay, he, Colta appears in his apartment and he's been shot. And then he said, Colta says, do you remember me? And then he's a child and Colta is visiting him as a child and playing doctor with him and saying, I'll take the stethoscope. Right. You listen, and yeah. you listen to my heart. I'll yeah. listen to your heart. Those are very touching moments that are going to shape a person for their whole life and are going to make his relationship with the off-worlders more profound and they're going to trust him and he's going to trust them because that trust was created when he was a child and the seeds of him becoming a scientist were given to him or were fertilized by that initial childhood interaction with Colta and, and then his explosive IQ. I mean, you know, and then you have to think of, okay, for an audience, what's going to be interesting about this story is going to be his relationship with the off-worlders, his relationship with classified or above top secret events mm -hmm. that we are going to learn about from his point of view. Yeah, and, and, and every single one of those issues, and as, as it appears in the book as well, obviously, and in, in our discussions, every one of those issues is a test to his own ethical sense, his, his own, own spiritual or... sense, his own humanity, and what does he betray in the, in the course of it? Or is, it, is the betrayal necessary? And of course, it never is. And one of the realizations that runs through the book is, look, look, we're putting borders around, we're putting a border around all of these events. We're assuming that it's finite. It's not. In fact, it's not even anything that we can, uh, anything that we even begin, can begin to understand. How do we address it? It's like, it's like right now, we have a point, I mean, here we are, all of us in the world, around the world, in a self-quarantine situation where we have to look at ourselves and say, okay, how did we get here? How did this happen? How, who, how do we share he responsibility or, la it. or lack of responsibility for what is going on now? And what are we gonna do about it? If we do nothing about it, when this is suddenly business, is business as usual, I mean, to be polite, in the most in the most gentlemanly terms, we are so beyond fucked. It's not funny. He writes about it throughout the book. He writes we about how we have to address. We have planet. to wait, wait. We have to address. We have to address these okay. questions now. Otherwise, it's over. Forget it. And if we cannot change, and we cannot share, and we can't change the whole the whole purpose of our relationships, the whole purpose of our being, the whole purpose of our intelligence, would we go back to the same kind of vanity, the same kind of aggressivity, the same kind of greed. phenomenal stupidity and greed that we are seeing in the political world, in, in, in the social world where we can't, even, we can't even talk to each other without saying, is this false news, is this fake news, is this real, is this not, what kind of shit is that? What kind of a relationship can you even begin to develop? Kay has a quote at one point from the book, in um, fact. Yeah, well, I mean, throughout the book, he is talking, he is calling out and saying, we're destroying each other. Um, he's talking about what are the hopes of the hopeless? Um, how there's such disparity and economic disparity. And he says at one point, he says, the children of planet Earth are waltzing and prancing and dancing nakedly through the fires of the special hell mankind has for himself and his progeny, created so very assiduously for all that is here and all that is to come. The mother nature is crying. The, planet. the mother is bleeding. It is part of the message from the crop circles all over this planet. And the message goes on as well as the beat goes on and on and the deaths and the killing. God, one has to admire mankind's remarkable consistency. That's brilliant. I mean, that's really, there, there you are. And that's, that's <laughs> right now. That's right, right now. now. Maybe that's yeah. why we're talking about it now. Yeah, because the message in this book is about taking care of each other, of the hopeless, 
and taking care of the planet. And and not taking <laughs> care of the planet and We're listening to the planet. We're creating our own hell. We have it's created. Not from a human point of view is what you want to say, right? It's yes. not from a, it's, so you are confused, we're confused. Remember, I told you when I called you, there are only two people in the world that I felt were not entirely 100% human, and they were Michael Wolf and Uri Geller. <laughs> I said, in my interviews as a journalist, I felt like I was in the presence of somebody who was from somewhere else who was shoved here, and they didn't understand what they were doing here, but they didn't really belong here. And those are the two people you work with. But well, Uri, and, and, Uri, and, Uri said to me at one point, we were driving in Rome, in fact, we were just going to the Piazza Navona. And uh, at one point I said, okay, Uri, let's talk about the nine. And I, and this we, this is another time, but he looked at me, all of a sudden he got so angry, and you know how Uri gets very, very uh, confused yeah. and sick. And he, his face comes right, and I'm driving, and his face comes right up to mine, and I said, Uri, move your head, I can't see the road. And he goes, the nine, the schmine. He says, listen to me, between my nose and your nose, how many universes are there between us right now? Millions, does that give you an idea that we don't know shit? And he went, <laughs> And I loved it. I just fell in love with him. I mean, them. Point, it was so funny. And he was so angry. Both of them you know? had contact I should know that. as children. Yeah. Both yeah. of them described yeah. having contact yes. with off-worlders that changed them. Uri suddenly had these incredible powers of, you know, telekinesis, et cetera, that he talks about at school. Michael did too, and though. Michael, Michael did. Right. Michael's IQ suddenly skyrockets to the point where he is no longer a normal kid. Yeah. So and it he was a little more he was a little more than normal, by the way. Yeah, but this, yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Even even when he was a, a kid. I right, mean. right. Yeah, there, yes. yeah, a couple of things I want to add. Number one, the catchers of heaven was because of his admiration for catchers in the rye, because he talked yeah. about uh, he talked about, uh, who was, what's the name of the author, Catchers in the Rye? Salinger. 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 Uh, Salinger. Yeah. So talk to me of, about Franny and Zoe or that, this, that other movie. Yeah, yeah. That, number one, that's where that comes from. Number two, when Adriano and I went to see him, uh, Adriano took a nap. At the same moment they both fell asleep, I saw Adriano's eyes go in the back of his head, just sleep at the same, and they woke up at the very same time which yeah. scared the living daylights out of me. I was sitting on the couch. I did not sleep because I was busy looking at the room and what was in there. When we left, there were dolphin sounds in the hallway that we could not make. Uh, he told us uh, that. Uh, yeah, Michael well, told us that. Yeah, and, and, and I thought it was the elevator that was squeaky. So I said, no, Adriano. And it was... And we got in the elevator and, and it was choo 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 choo. It was the chirps, the it was the chirps. Yeah. 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 All the way down. That night, we were trying to save money. So we were in the same hotel room. Uh, Adriano's bed was towards the window, mine was towards the bathroom. Uh, at three o'clock, I woke up just, w and I've never had any experiences in my whole entire life. I woke up, my hands were out, I looked at the window and I saw a big swirling blue psychedelic light coming in. Adriano jumps out of bed, screaming at the top of his lungs, Paola, Paola. I said, what's wrong? And when I turned on the lights, everything stopped. And he right. said, I hear a, a, a robotic female voice say in my solar plexus, and I'm pointing to my solar plexus, you are soul in English. Adriano's Italian. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he started to cry for the fear, for the fear. He's wanting to go on spaceships. He wants to go in outer space. And this guy's crying. I, <laughs> he's crying out of fear. We had the lights on all night. He went back to sleep with the lights. <laughs> I, I was confused. And Michael calls at 10 o'clock. And I said, he said, why aren't you here? And we said, because Michael last night, he goes, I sent my friends to you. <laughs> if you refused the experience, they will not force it. And uh, we went and told this story to top ufologist Gilles Dabourdet from France, covered it in San Marino. That's when Stanton Freeman laughed at it, you know. 
uh, he covered it as part of his talk in San Marino that these things had happened because these ufologists in Europe were, and Michael Hesman, who went to Michael Wolf's house, left a taxi cab waiting four hours outside until he came out. So he's a, a, a ufologist. He works for the Vatican now, mm -hmm. but you know, he was a ufologist from Germany. This yeah. is a big top story, guy. And I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. There's so much more here, but uh, Maurizio, do you want to add anything? And then I'll go back to the Gellers because I want to ask them if there's any chance of resurrecting it. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, it is very, very spirit. A very, let's say that there is a, there is something that is very peculiar regarding Michael. <clears throat> is the fact that being a journalist and a, a translate, translator, adapter of books, <clears throat> and let's say that I translated hundreds and hundreds of articles, I never found myself in a difficult, in, in such a difficult uh, situation, having to read the lines and to try to understand in between the lines. Sure. Sure. of what the content of his message was into those lines. For instance, the way the book is composed and it has all these strange undertitles or mm -hmm. subtitles, this yeah. is the type. Chapter 13, then there is a title, then there is a subtitle. Right. Right. Usually, as a journalist, I will tell you that the subtitle is intended to be here because it has to express in few words the content of the entire chapter. Not at all. I mean, this is something that is placed there because his soul was projected in here in these three lines and doesn't have anything to do with the content of the, the, the chapter. So... One poor translator is left uh, with the, uh, the, the big question, am I stupid or is too intelligent for me? Am I uh, terrestrial or is the non-terrestrial being? In fact, I see, go right here, for instance. What chapter, chapter 14, all right? Chapter 14. The, per, the uh, persistence of human cosmic memory or footprints of the old ones. Can you please help me in understand what sure. is said well, here? That's a different 14 than ours. Yes, yeah, a different yeah. 14 in this book. We have Growing Up an Unhappy Zoroastrian. In oh, four. maybe. What, what, what volume you have? Uh, this is, this is I volume believe two. The, I believe it's the first that one. No, no, no. Uh, this is volume uh, two. It's the original volume. one. No, it's the second We're printing. Second printing. Second. All right. Volume two on leaving. That's the title. Yeah, on leaving, right. All right. Um, so, so when, when I translated the, the book for oh, the I first see. time. Oh, I see. Okay. Chapter 14 of volume right. two. Right. Okay. <clears throat> when I... When I translated the book the first time, I was 1908, approximately. Uh, it was too quick, too, uh, too rapid, and, not, and absolutely impossible to understand. But we printed and we published and we sold uh, thousands of copies. I, I received so many uh, inquiries and uh, people was protesting, saying we didn't understand anything at all it's it, it it's a nice book uh, mr bayada we we thank you because we, we publish it but please give us a clue to what, <laughs> yeah or what is the real content of the book so i said to myself i don't have a you know an answer yeah, I just, read the book yeah. and try to read it as it is like a movie it's not so you can go back i mean camera back like it's a Jodorowsky situation, camera back and your mind will be connected again to the initial phrases that you didn't understand. But don't give too much, too much rationalism of, 
of yourself because you are a because rational I, yeah. person, you know, to understand it. Now, 15 years later, I translated again. And I believe that uh, the end of the game is exactly what you were saying before, that the reason this book is important is now. Probably 20 years ago, it was still important, but not so much important as now because of the major crisis, I mean, the tragic crisis that we're facing. So, um, one more point, not final, but one more point. Maybe a movie can help us to understand, but uh, let's say you have a very difficult task, very difficult task. Try to be Michael. Try to have Michael with you when you decide, you, when you're taking the big decisions, who's gonna be, you know, the main actor, who's gonna <laughs> be, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Do you because, want to hear the story? <laughs> we, 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 we were there. Yeah. Tell, yeah, no, tell the story, tell the story. I, at the time, I think that we thought there was one actor who had simpatico eyes, and this is, of course, 20 years ago, um, and it was yeah. Gavin Byrne, who would have the humanity as well as the intelligence to play this character. And I think we had just seen him in a Vin Vendors movie, End of Violence, which mm. was brilliant. staggering. And so he was like, kind of like, at least what, who I saw as that kind of Michael Wolf figure. Um, but Steve can tell the story of mm -hmm. getting the film. Well, one of the difficulties, of course, with, as, as I mean, here we are, we're talking around who is Michael. And of course the, 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 the screenplay really does that and uses the, uses, as I say, be, taking these elements of his life that are really dramatic and really important and that create a, you know, the mystery of who is Michael Wolf. And, and as he, you know, as, as the head comes up, it's hit by another force that he has to deal with, which is living in these times. And then mm -hmm. it's, it's the whole socio-political issues that, that run through catchers that you cannot deny. Plus, I mean, we're, we want to see it for the reasons that we're all talking to each other today, because we're interested in a little more than James Jesus Angleton. Uh, yeah. you know, and, and what was the American policy in Vietnam and MK Ultra and that shit, which, okay, we already know that. So the other thing is, is far more important. Anyway, um, we got to the point where we said, yes, we're, we're set. We really, we've got the structure and we did it and we, and Michael agreed, and that's to me. Okay, all right. I, I, so we get the. We, we now are going to, um, to said okay, who are we going to give this to? And I go through all of my list of studio heads, and I know I'm not going to go through any readers. I'm not going to go through any independent producers. I want to get to the top head of a studio that I've worked with, and that's going to be where we're going to get a yes or a no because yes. everybody is going to be goofed by this material unless you've yeah. got a very a third-rate director who's very big attached well, to it and that goes this script in the movie and who yeah cares, my boss can i, so can what, I give you just a suggestion well, no, well, this, whoa 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 happened. Mary, so this is a story yeah. that happened oh, it happened this, this happened, happened already it happened. It happened already ah. Right. No, this was this was yeah, this was in the eighties. Okay. okay, all right. So, I mean the nineties, I'm sorry, in the nineties. So uh I'm I'm not gonna mention any names. If you're not gonna mention the Messagero, I'm not gonna mention the Hollywood student. No, no, don't worry about it. So that'll be <laughs> no. So anyway I can uh, give you a name with just a name. We're, we're, we're together no Fred. Leo, Leo. No, no surname, just the okay, first okay, name. Exactly. Leo. All right. So anyway, um I Think of the one studio head whom I, I can't, I don't trust any of them, but I mean the one that, that, that would give it a read, who's not stupid. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna get it to him. And if I get it to him, we're okay. And I start first, okay, with two producers under, under him at the studio and they, and I just kind of talk a little bit about it and I've got, forget it, I've got to go to him. I just start a little bit and they they don't, they don't get anywhere near the material. So I finally call, I think, all right, that's it. And I've tried two other studio heads, not gonna happen. And I go to him and I say, 
all right, I've got a script that is unlike anything else that's ever been done. This is not <laughs> apocryphal. This is a true story. And I give him a very five minutes of Michael Wolf. And he says, are you serious? And I said, I'm very serious. He said, could I, where are you now? And I said, well, we're in Rhode Island, but I can get this, uh, I'll immediately get this over to you. He said, look, I'm going the day after tomorrow. I'm going to New York. Please send it to me directly in my office, my secretary. I'll put it in my briefcase and I'll read it on the plane. It's exactly what I want. It could not be better because mm. the plane is the only place where, you know, they, they can actually read and not rely upon, oh, here, give it to the secretary, we'll give it to somebody else. You get a reader's report and forget it. It doesn't get, it's not gonna happen. But it was like, oh, perfect timing. So uh, I get the script and send it off to him. I call the secretary, it's set. She said, yes, we received it. I've got it in his briefcase. So I said, can I talk to him? He said, it's in your briefcase. He said, he said is it really? I said, go look, I'm joking, ha ha ha. Look in your briefcase. I went, yes, it is. I said, who's it dedicated to? Well, Michael Wolf. Yes, exactly. It's his story. Great. Great. I'm going to read it. I'm going to be leaving early tomorrow morning. And I, the first thing I'll do, and I'll get back to you over the weekend. It could not be a better situation. The timing is ideal. Okay. So I call up Michael and I said, Michael, this is incredible. So and so at this studio, it has it in a briefcase, and he's going to be winging his way eastward, and he will be reading it. The script will be in his hand. Your story is there uninterrupted in first class with a pillow behind his head and his feet stretched out. What could be better? Michael said, That's wonderful. Uh, that's really exciting. And I said, Yes, we're very happy. We'll see what happens because, to my mind, if it doesn't happen with him, forget it because this is the most intelligent read we have, and it's at the top. Okay. So about 10 minutes later, no, it wasn't 10 minutes. It was it was 20. Yeah, 20 minutes later, I get a call back from Michael. He says, hi, Steve. I said, Michael? Yes, Michael. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, you know that stupid studio, and I'm not gonna give you the exact dialogue because Michael suddenly became a lunatic. Michael suddenly started swearing like I ne he never did. He would never talk like that. It was suddenly a barroom battle. It was so weird. And I said, Michael, what are you talking about? He said, that studio, I called him up. I said, whoa, you did what? I called up that secretary, you, that secretary of that guy. I said, yeah. And I just wanted to say, you're so lucky to have this script because there's nothing in the world like it. They did a great job, but I'm not like anybody else on the planet. And you're lucky to be able, you're lucky to be able to tell this story and you bloody well better ought to take it or you're totally a shit and your guy is an asshole. And he's going on and on. <laughs> and he said, yeah, and he is now. He's putting him down Listen for this dreadful, this and you know, and, 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 and Kay is, w is so walking in and she's staring at it's me stunned. and she's saying, what's going on? What? And I said, Michael has just alienated that entire studio. I mean, he has, he has called the worst names of the secretary. He has called the studio head absolutely idiotic because he hasn't taken it and he should take it right now because he's the most important person on the planet. And I said, Michael, you have just destroyed the whole deal. It's over with. Michael, we spent a long time putting this together and you've managed in less than two minutes to completely blow it. You gotta be kidding. And I mean, it was, it was totally, it was ever. funny. Yeah. It was funny in the most hideous way as only Hollywood can be hideously funny. But there it was from Michael. And, and I said, as far as my relationship with him, I mean, I don't give a shit because I really don't care about studio heads, but there's no way that I can ever send anything I've written to that studio or anyone, anyone involved with this particular studio head and all that, but that's not even the point. The point is, where were you? Who asked you to call up anybody? Why, why did you do that? That's okay, big question it made is why? no. It made no sense. I said, it made, "Why did you? Why did <clears throat> did I tell you to do that?" No, and he wouldn't back down. He didn't say, "I'm sorry." He didn't say, "Oh, oh, that was a mistake." There wasn't. It was like talking to. Oh, okay. I have <laughs> eleven Michael Wolves. I've caught on my way to heaven. As is K. This is the twelfth. This is the one I don't. <laughs> this is the 
this one I don't want to know about because this is a barroom brawl. I mean, he, what he was saying, he was saying to this poor assistant to the head of the studio was outrageous. You know? So that was it. Now I said, Michael, I can't at this point in time, there's no way I can go anywhere else in this country. You have managed, you, I mean, because I'm telling you, this studio head is going to dine out on this story. And there are only seven people, seven people he has to talk to. I mean, we're completely screwed. There is no one we can go to. We could go to Europe, but I don't think it'd be very hard. I can't think of anyone at this point and I don't speak German, so I can't speak. Those are the only producers that I can think of. Because, I mean, you know, the Italian directors, that, I mean, producers I worked for, I was no longer speaking with because I was doing my own Michael Wolf with De Laurentiis and Ponti and the others. You know, when we didn't. Uh, Stephen, when was the last time? Did you cut off with Michael? When was the last time? We you never cut off Michael. No. When was the last no. time you spoke to him? Tell me about the last time you spoke to him. I, I don't even remember I, because at the same time this was happening, we had a child. Yes. So we got very preoccupied with having our child and... We spoke to Michael a couple of other times. After yeah. that, we did. We, yeah, but yeah. I think Steve had just basically said, Michael, there's nothing we can do with the script, so... It, yeah, I, and we, you know, every, I mean, as I say, I for two he, and a half years, we were on the I floor. remember him calling a few times and complaining about his handler. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go I, into detail about... We're not that. going to. That was an issue, and that and, and that was, was not... An issue. Was, yeah, right. I, I he threatened a lot of people, including uh, the pilot, Max Poggi. Oh, no, I know, I know. And yeah, in fact, in fact uh, there was... The handler's name came up afterwards. Uh, and, and as I said to you, I think there's another reason for Michael behaving that way, that I did, I may be wrong. It no, may have no, no, been no, Michael and one of his manias, I don't know. Uh, he left me out in the hallway because of that person for 20 minutes. Well, I, I believe died. that. After I, I had flown in, but listen, wh how did you hear that he died? Well, well this, how did you hear he died? I think I, it was um, on the internet. It was on the internet. Yeah, I do, I honestly honestly don't remember. I and really I, don't. You know remember. what? I mean, it could have been an occasion where I said, "I wonder what's happened to Michael," and then I googled it. And then I don't. We know talked to him a couple of times afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't I mean, like it, it wasn't was, like oh that was it. Boom! I'm not talking. It wasn't. It wasn't that. It was so extreme, and I have a weird sense of humor that when I saw the whole situation, I started laughing because it was so bizarre, <laughs> and it was a kind of. To be to actually be able to one up a studio the way that Michael did, I thought was you know. Uh, First of all, I thought it was interesting. Per per so perverse and marvelous. I thought it was Rohan. interesting that he got that far up via a phone call. No, no, no. They knew. They knew all about it. He went right into but that didn't office. But he have their he, number. Yes, he 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 said he. I I asked him that. He said no. Just I called the studio and I asked for his office and she answers the phone. Hello. Oh. Okay, so simple. then I, I don't know how I met you guys. Oh, gosh. That is so was it from, was it Was it from, no, Paolo, was it from, was it from, it wasn't from Uri, was it? No. Was it because I of Uri? I never talked to Uri about Michael. Well, I no, 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 no. It, was, it had nothing to do with Michael. It was late. I'm not, no, the or, very my weird. relationship with Uri was before, was before Michael. Yeah, and but I know. My like, relationship with Andrea Bahar was before you. Uri. Well, how did I get your telephone yeah. number? How did I get to you? I don't know. Was it through? Jack um, was it? No, but no, I'm you know, you know what? It, it was the spirit of James no, no, Jesus no. Eagleton. Was he was channeling <laughs> Jack Sarfati? <laughs> no, I think because I remember looking for you because I heard about it and and I went. I don't know how I found you, but it I was because of Michael. Well, I was it you through were in Jack Jack when I called you because I used to live in Providence. I remember you mentioning that, but was uh, it John Mack? Was it because of John Mack? Was it because of John Mack? No, no, no. John Mack didn't even ever talk about Michael. I don't know how I got to you, but just. No, I wonder if you got to, if you called Steve because of a connection with John Mack that had no, nothing to do with no, Michael. No, no. 
I had your telephone number. The conversation was I called you in Jamestown. Well, then, if that was the case. Oh, I know. But you were, were you doing the UFO conference in Newport? No, there was no conference in Newport. I went with John Mack to Newport, but I had nothing to do with you. I, I don't yeah, know we how it there. got. I wonder if maybe. How did I maybe. even get a script? How do I even get a copy of the script? You must, it must have, I mean, you it must have been something through Michael then. It had okay, to be. It must Michael. have been something be, right. through Michael because how would I get a script? Yeah, it I had to been through Michael. I remember how I got this. We sent that to you. Yeah. Oh, you sent it to me. Yeah, yeah, you asked for it. We sent okay. it to you. So it had to have been through Michael. Okay. It, it well, had to have been through Michael. Okay, so Maurizio, you just connected with these people and you're still working on the Michael Wolf story. So we've got to wrap this up because I'm going to put this on Patreon just to, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have to cut it up in a few pieces. But would you uh, just uh, wrap up? what the Michael Wolf case, and you've done so many cases, means to you? Well, the main difference is that I never met the guy, unfortunately. Um, so I you didn't have- You talked to him on the phone though. Yeah, I, so many times. And, <laughs> and, and strangely enough, again, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tapes uh, from the 80s, the early 80s, including a David Bowie interview I made in 1980, uh, at the end of 1980 in New York, when I used to live there. Um, so um, all these tapes I have, hundreds and hundreds, are okay. I have five or six audio tapes of my phone conversations with him. None are working anymore. They are you know, they, they, I don't know why. Yeah, they are all blurred, all blah, 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 yeah, blah, like weird, this. Weird. Very weird, because yeah. it never occurred to me. I, again, I have an interview with Alberto Sordi, the great sure. actor oh. I, made, I, I made in 1982. Mm. Uh, it's perfect, it's still perfect. I have hundreds. Just The ones I have with Michael, that don't work anymore. So, so I don't know. He yeah, was I, able to I, oxidize. It happens with stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely I right. It happens, it, I mean, there are so many similarities between Michael and Uri. Um, and you're talking about a mechanical voice that comes across yeah, and yeah. speaks. And when Uri was working with Andrea Poharic, that happened. And the mechanical voice was called Spectra and was an uh, interface between them and the nine. And all their tapes would disintegrate or they would disintegrate. they intended yeah. to tape something yeah. and you cannot save them you know it's they stay there and i'm so uh, upset that i want to i want to use it but yeah. i can't yeah, no. uh, never, nevertheless a nevertheless. lot of different researchers with different phenomena when they get too close and they want to tape it or videotape it or record it the, it's, gone. it's gone it doesn't mm. record which uh, when he was in his um, teen, not teens, but actually when he was 16 or 17, he attended an high school, all right? And as far as, as we know, from his standard life, right. what, what occurred in his standard life was that his mom refused to give to this guy, to Michael, the attentions that right. were given instead right to the other brother and the sister. So we thought, okay, probably they're saying right now that Michael was a psychopath or, yeah. you know, that he had some something wrong already when he was 15 or 16. Right, right. Therefore, blah, 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 blah. And his family took the advantage of becoming, you know, they, they were eligible for a pension because right. Michael was in a, they declared that Michael was um, um, psychologically you know, yeah, yeah. there. Right. right. I we remember found, that. I remember we, that. Found, we found the almanac of his school, yeah, his high school, where it, it is extremely clear. You know, there's a picture of him with all elegant and right, time, right, you know, right. and then the description, brief. B very brief, right. stating that the guy was a brilliant student, very sure. keen, 
very keen, especially as far as chemical stuff and I don't know if mathematics is mentioned. Right. So <laughs> the school records when he was 17 or 18 were adamant, were very high, but his family was declaring that the guy was, you know. The story of his funny. life, isn't it? It's the story of his life. So, it's the story of his life. The government so, did the same thing. I mean, it's... Uh, it's so Stanton Friedman did not, did not uh, uh, go to, in Lent um, to understand why Michael's uh, um, records magically disappeared after his, you know, when he, he died and all his records and all his documents and all his stuff disappeared from the apartment. Roberto Ferguson, I don't and know if I try not to mention names. I'm sorry. He's oh, talking okay. about, he's, no, the name he mentioned is the, is the person from a messaggero. Yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is this, my, uh, Michael's, that's a long story because when he, all of his things disappeared, but it was the handler that came and took them because well, Unfortunately, the woman that took him home, and I'm not going to mention her name, the, the caregiver, is, died early of Morgellons yeah. disease. But and the that point is that all his stuff, yes. everything disappeared. 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 Yeah, disappeared. So this is major because yeah. we have a person who dealt with the American Secret Service at the top level for sure, because I, I haven't met in my life another one who was in charge for, uh, as a liaison between the Greys or the Nordics right. or the right. other exactly. races, okay, with, with somebody in the, in the militaries who were not able to understand what these aliens were saying. And instead, they had to use as, you know, a link, in between, they had to use somebody like an interface. Yeah, yeah, the interface. So I believe that for the first time ever, what I understood was that Michael was very special, not a clone, but very special, acting as a, in between our civilization at the end of the eighties, the nineties. All right, and the people who were visiting Earth. So what's more than this? If I had to go to a, a TV station in Italy and tell the story of Michael Wolf, they will reject it in no time. Yeah, of they course. will not of give course. any I, credit even to no. me. And I am a journalist and I am well known as a journalist, Sears, but this story is too outrageous. Yeah, so that's, right. that's the reason also why he decided to put a disclaimer at the beginning of the, uh, the book saying, Everything that you're going to see in this, depicted in this book, has to deal with the situation pertaining Italy, America, I mean, United States, the British, the French, the Germans, and whatever, and the Israeli, Israeli too, because I think Israelis. he also worked uh, as Uri did. They are at, they become assets for the, the intelligence community. Exactly. So, all these countries, all these nations yeah. dealt with the aliens, but he's saying none that you're going to read is for sure. It's for real. So what else? He was okay. the real one. So <laughs> I think we're going to, I'm going to thank you all. and we're, We'll talk privately after this, but for the people that are all interested and, and could uh, make some sense out of the book, I think it's important that we remember this man, that we were part of his life, and that we that he wanted something to happen. So you're right that this is the time for a reassessment, a reset. So it's a possibility that we could work together in all these countries for something to happen. So Desta, um, just, We'll thank our audience and cut this part off, okay? And we say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Okay. Okay. Yeah.